and Doug invited me to do this. I've been affectionately calling it the pummel attack. He said, if Doug can do this on a Sunday morning, I can do it too. I'm glad it's just one, so very, very thankful for this family. So as he said, my name is Barbara Mills. I am the executive director for Voice of Hope Pregnancy and Family Center. And until the 19th of April, we operate three centers. We have one in Upper Sandusky, Ohio, up Marion, Ohio, and Bucyrus, Ohio, and coming soon, Forest, Ohio. So we're really grateful for this opportunity to share the ministry that God has given us with your community. So today I want to quickly describe what we do. Um, I can only paint with a wide brush. There's so much more than what I can describe in just a few minutes. But I do ask that everyone get this brochure from the table back there. I'm going to leave the table behind. I'll pick up the stuff in the morning. When I come in the morning, I hope that the only thing I see on the table is my tablecloth, the stand, and the baby model. But other than that, please take the resources. That's just a tiny bit of what we have. There's an invitation here to put on your refrigerator for a reminder to join us for the celebration and the ribbon cutting coming up on the 18th. Now, what I want to do is just quickly describe what services we're bringing to your community. So we are a ministry. We started as Bethel Pro-Life Ministries, but now we go by Voice of Hope, Pregnancy, and Family Center. We believe very passionately in being pro-life but being pro-life for life, for the life of the person, not just fetus focus, but person focus. And I'm going to quickly describe how we accomplish those things for the past and get this straight. So number one, we are a pregnancy center. We offer laboratory-grade pregnancy tests to anyone who comes in our office. All of our services are free. What we want to do is establish life immediately and use life-affirming words with love and provide a judgment-free place for women to come when they're faced with a crisis pregnancy. So we give them a, a laboratory-grade pregnancy test. We can issue them a proof of a positive test. We do not do diagnosis. Um, but we give them that proof of positive test so they can get continued help with insurance and any other assistance that they may be able to obtain from their community. So it's important that we offer these things for free. So we don't always know why mom is coming to us. They might just need the, you know, the proof of the positive test. But we want to establish life. We want to say this is a baby coming. And we want to find out what's going on with mom. You know, what type of anxiety will this cause for her and her world? And we want to offset those anxieties. So we also, in addition to the laboratory grade pregnancy test, we offer first trimester ultrasounds. 90% of the women who are not sure if they will choose life will do so if they get a chance to see and hear their baby. So we want to provide a voice for the voiceless, and we do that through ultrasound. Um, when we do begin at our forest center, we will not be doing ultrasounds here at first. Um, I almost have everything I need. I actually need a sonographer, so whisper that around to everybody you know. But um, the Lord just dropped out of the sky, and I'm almost speaking literally, an examination table, and we now have a portable machine. So it's not too far from our reach. I want to tell you that but we will be offering the pregnancy test and then the services that are provided to moms who are pregnant. So what we do to offset that anxiety caused by this unplanned pregnancy, three areas that we, we see mostly that women who are not sure if they want to carry their baby, number one, they're alone because this is not a good timing. They've been abandoned by their father, their family, sometimes their church, their friends, their community, and we want them to know they're not alone. Number two, maybe they don't know how to raise a child. They don't have the education and the modeling that's needed that most of us have had. So we offer parenting classes. Mom can come to our centers, take parenting classes. We have over 200 hours available from the moment of conception through every stage of your child's life. Because remember, we're not fetus focused, we're parenting focused. So that second you become pregnant, you become a parent. So we have parent education training to how to care for yourself and your child from the moment of conception until the child grows up and leaves your home. We have lessons on how to rent an apartment, how to balance a checkbook, how to make a budget, and sometimes our parents benefit from that information as well. So we do want to do everything that we can to meet mom at our needs. It, there's a lot of reasons. It's not just limited to those three things. So she doesn't have resources, she doesn't have the mentorship and the education. So mom can come to our class, she can come see us at the center, we will mentor her, we will talk with her, we'll also give her these classes that I'm telling you about, and then for her time with us, 
we're going to pay her with baby bucks. Then mom can take the baby bucks that she has to the boutique area and shop for her child. So we don't want her to stress about where she going to get a crib. How she going to provide diapers and wipes and formula and car seats and socks and shoes and everything. I call it the crown of anxiety. You know, what makes us nervous about having a baby in our house? What makes us nervous of being responsible for another human being? So we want to take those anxieties and help her with as many avenues as we can that's given to us. Now, again, I could talk forever about everything that we're doing. I really hope you come and join us at this Ribbon Tide Event Open House because there's so much more that I want to tell you about. But real quick, I want you to know that the things that I've discussed that the mom needs that has too many lines in this pregnancy test, these are the exact same things that all families need. I need this kind of help. So we, the other dynamic of this ministry, we're just simply a family center. You don't have to be contemplating abortion. You can just simply have too much month and not enough money. You can just simply be another mom that needs to talk to someone. You can be completely wealthy financially, but not with relationships. So we have a family center that if mom chooses life, she can move into our family center and take the classes, get the mentorship, get the resources that she needs, and help her with the tools that she needs to be successful, and dads can join this program. So we not only need volunteers for women to help mentor moms, we need dads, because we have a lot of men in our program taking advantage of these parent training classes. But to move on to the next part, too much, you know, too many lines in the pregnancy test, family center, we help families with too much month and not enough money or just need the extra support, but we're also a restoration center. We work with community organizations, we work with children's services, and any organization that wants to help families become stronger. And Children's Services will refer parents to us who have lost custody of their children or are at risk of doing that. Why do they do that? What did I tell you that we offer for these families? We offer a mentorship. Do you think these broken families that are faced with tragedy had a mentor in their life to help them? They haven't. We help with resources. We help them provide the things that they need for their children that they've earned so they can get the diapers, the wipes, and the formula. Sometimes the, the struggle and the crisis of not being able to provide for your family causes you to make choices that otherwise you wouldn't have made. So we want to be there for them with that mentorship and with the resources and the connection to the community and the education component. So Children's Services will actually send their clientele to us so we can help them get the parent training that they need and we give them certificates of completion in their journey of trying to reunify with their children or keep from losing their children. Now, again, there's so much more that I can tell you, but I want you to know this Forest Center, we are pro-life for life, and that is what we're offering to your community. We cannot do it ourselves. We need your help. We need volunteers. We need partners, and I know that we can do a beautiful thing because lives are saved. People accept Christ. Families are strengthened with education and information, and we have gotten written reports where families have reun reunified successfully with their children, and it doesn't stop there. They continue to come and take advantage of the good kind of our services. So again, thank you. I don't want to dip into Pastor Doug's time, but I look forward to meeting each of you individually and to come tomorrow and find my empty table. Take the resources. Thanks, everyone. Uh, 31st chapter of Jeremiah. We're going to pick it up at the 31st verse. So we're going to go Jeremiah 31, 31. And... Uh, this again is a poignant and profound statement from the prophet Jeremiah talking about the new covenant among us. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them out of the land of Egypt and bought them the sea, they broke that covenant. Um, though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people.
and they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, says the Lord, you should know the Lord for everyone, from the least of these to the greatest, will know, uh, will know me already, says the Lord. And I will give them, let's see, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. I will forgive their wickedness and never again remember their sins. You know, we are going through a period of Lent, through the season of Lent, and uh, this officially, uh, it is the last Sunday in Lent. Because when we do Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday is not part of Lent. So this is our last Sunday of reflection and of contemplation over the season of Lent and over ourselves and over the things that God would have us to um, uh, examine about ourselves. That's the season of Lent. Season of Lent is a 40-day preparation, getting ready for the um, celebration of the resurrection. And this, um, and we're just really near the very end of that cycle, the 40 days. We've all heard the adage at one time or another in our lives, when something is too good to be true, it probably is. I would, maybe all of us have heard that from a parent. I know I heard it from my dad more than once. And for good reason. I always thought things sounded too good. Uh, but, um, you know, you, you could be talking to a realtor about buying a house. And the house is the biggest, rubiest, nicest, cleanest, most well-fixed up home you've ever seen in your life. And it's in the nicest neighborhood. Now, they don't mention the fact that they have to have extra police patrols in the neighborhood over the weekends, and that neighborhood watch is um, a good kind of a paramilitary unit in your neighborhood. But it's a nice house. Nicest you'll ever see. Or, or a, a used car salesman. This is the nicest pre-owned you've ever known. This is the cleanest and most lowest mileage car on the lot. Never mentioned that it was submerged in 10 feet of water during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans where it sat on a car lot. But hey, it's a nice car. And then there's a TV pitch artist. It will cook everything that's near it. It will dice it. It will slice it. It will chop it. It will skin it. It will absolutely make a great dish out of anything you can imagine. For the low, low price of $99.99 in three easy installments. Yeah, we've all listened to things like that. We've all known of things like that. We've all known that in many ways they are probably too good to be true. But Jeremiah's prophecy at this 31st chapter in the 31st verse is not too good to be true. It's God's promises about the future. It's God's promises into the future. Jeremiah is certainly prophesying about something that has not yet happened, but it will happen. And we know when it will happen. And we have the privilege of living on the other side of the fulfillment of this prophecy. And we have seen what has happened. And we can understand and know what has happened. And it can be part of who we are, part of our lives. Uh, this future was promised to us by God through the prophet Isaiah. We worship and serve a God, our Father, our Creator, and His promises are faithful and true. Faithful 
and true, not too good to be true. These promises are made because God intends to have relationship with us. God intends to know us and for us to know Him. For us to know Him. And I think in the, when you look at the whole scope of the New Testament, you can see that God is, I would go so far as to say, desperate to have relationship with us, to know us, and to know, um, and to redeem us, and to bring us into his kingdom at the end of our days. We're in his kingdom right now, but we really get to see it when our time here is over in this world. But God is wanting to have relationships with us. And we are precious in God's sight. Remember that little ditty we used to sing in uh, maybe uh, VBS or, or Sunday school? Jesus loves the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. You all remember that? We used to sing that. And, and I think we can also sing it in a way that uh, we probably haven't thought about it, but... God loves all the adults of this world, red and yellow, black and white. They are all precious in His sight. God desires relationship. And He has shown that relationship, as Jeremiah alluded to, in a series of covenants. A covenant is a relationship from one that is greater to one that is lesser, in which both parties participate. Uh, and we, we know the line that God says, I will be their God, they will be my people. Sounds pretty good. But it's not too good to be true. Within the covenants that have existed in the Old Testament, we see the covenant with Abraham. God promised land. God promised a nation. And God promised faith to one and all. And, and in that context uh, of Abraham, we see that faithful people all around the world can trace their heritage to Abraham. Uh, Abraham God fulfilled the promises. God placed faith in the hands of humankind because he wanted relationship with all of humankind. So that was the promise made to Abraham. Land, a nation, blessings to all nations and faith. And then to Moses. Moses, he promised law. He promised sacrifices. And the law and the sacrificial system is something that leads to forgiveness. It is a work of grace among us. It is God communicating to us the things he wants us to understand, know, and do. So we see the law is grace. And in this particular day and age, we see the sacrifices that God is, that, 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 that we make to God, or that the ancient Hebrew people made to God, as also the work of grace that built relationship. That built relationship. God gave the people of Moses a choice between life and death, and he told them to choose life. And that, that was a blessing, and that was grace. So Moses had a covenant. Abraham had a covenant. And David has a covenant. And we see things begin to sharpen a little bit with David. Things sharpen somewhat. They get more concise, more carefully focused. David is promised an everlasting dynasty. A dynasty that will go on forever like the kingdom of God. And he is promised a perfect ruler <coughs> would come from his line, from his heritage. And that, of course, would be the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is promised a Messiah. 
And that's a good thing. And David wanted to build a, the temple for God, but it didn't quite happen that way. David's son built the temple. But um, David had tremendous promise from his from the Lord his God. And Jesus. Jesus brings a new covenant still, but this covenant's different from all the rest. This covenant has forgiveness built into it. This covenant has hope built into it. This arrangement between God and his people is a different slant, a different angle in the way of a covenant. It is not a law written in stone, it's a law written in our hearts. It becomes internalized. It becomes part of who we are. It is a total transformation of the believer. Uh, in Christ all things are new. Our scripture affirms us. And Jeremiah declared uh, that it is abundantly clear that uh, there will not be so much as a new law, as new grace. There will be riches and there will be a touch in our heart that will make all the difference in who we are in God's presence and God's love and in God's kingdom. The covenant does not do away with the law. Jesus' covenant does not do away with the law. It is grace. It is solid grace. It brings the law closer by having Christ in our hearts. The new covenant is of promise, not of works. And, it, uh, and what the law requires, what the law requires, and the law requires righteousness, the gospel gives us. And that's a tremendous treasure in the new covenant, is that it has grace. And it gives us what the law requires. It gives us righteousness through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our hearts, the ancient center of who we are, and that's what an ancient person felt, is that emotionally and um, physically, our hearts were the center of who we are. And the way they reckon, the way they reckon that, you know, when we get excited, our heart starts beating faster. When we get, um, when we exercise, and in their eyes become the most alive, our hearts beat faster. And uh, when we get bad news, they felt like our hearts were sad. Um, so uh, the way the ancient people looked at this, and uh, I'm not sure they're they're that off target. They really aren't. Is um, these promises are written in our hearts. They become inside of us. They become internalized. That is God's new covenant with us. Promises that we can keep forever and hold on to. And that become part of us. Um, forgiveness, not sinlessness, is envisioned by this new covenant. And the relationship to God is restored by faith in Christ. So we're talking about restoration. We're talking about hope. We're talking about grace. We're talking about every good thing that comes to us from God. And the wonderful thing about it is it's not too good to be true. It is not too good to be true. It's the truest thing in fact, that will ever happen to us. So, this is an important season of the year. This is a time when we look inside of ourselves. This is a time when we see how God's grace has touched us, is touching us, and will touch us in the future. This is a time when we open ourselves to our, to, to our own self and to God to make ourselves prepared to celebrate this uh, 
resurrection time that's coming among us in only two weeks. So, this week, let's look within. Let's look at ourselves. Let's look at who we are, what we're becoming, where we're at. And uh, let's share together in the goodness that God has birthed inside of us, in his work, in his will. For one thing for sure, what God promises us is simply not too good. And God is calling us. He's calling us into relationship. He's calling us into friendship. He's calling us uh, in sincerity. God is calling out to us, reaching out to us, and wanting to be in relationship to us. He is calling softly and tenderly. From Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This is the word of the Lord for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm really thankful for Jeff's help today because this is one way we do. So we were practicing holding the book and to figure out how we could do everything that we needed to do today. So I'm very thankful for all of his help. I'm also thankful that the reception that we'll be having in the Family Life Center. Uh, thank you, Sheila Preston and Carol Langford. I saw helping as well. So uh, thank you, ladies. Today is Confirmation Day. Today, six smiling young people smile <laughs> are sitting before you eventually they're going to stand in front of in front see that there was their parents grandparents pastor but most importantly they're going to stand before god and they're going to say i believe it'll be a holy moment for everyone but if you think that holy moment will only happen today, I have great news for you. This confirmation day is for each of us. Luther says this idea of affirming one's baptism is a daily event, that every day we recall that we were chosen of God. Every day, every day, we are invited to say yes to the God who loves us. So this is a holiday, a holy day, not just for our confirmation days, but for all of us as well. May God bless your smiling faces today as we, as you, respond to God's gracious invitation to faith. I want to start today to talk about the board games that we used to play when you were a child. At our house, it was Uno, that was like the game and we played it a lot. And one night, just before bedtime, Matt and Jill wanted to play one more game. I was like, okay, one more game. So Jeff and I agreed. That one game lasted 45 minutes. <laughs> the longest Uno game ever in history. We must have shuffled and reshuffled that deck four times. It's crazy. Well, now we have a game that we play with our grandkids. And we played it from Cole down to Walter called Guess Who, and I don't know if everybody's seen it, but it has a little, all the little people, and you flip them up, and you have the little cards with people, and you try to guess who the other person, person is, so you get to ask questions, like, does he have red hair, is he wearing glasses, it's a girl, so that's what we've been playing with our grandkids, but now they started beating us, um, one time I was playing with Clayton, and we had like, I had like 12 people left, and he only had one, or he had well, and I was in whatever it was, and I tried to guess. So he had like 12 people up, and I'm looking at all of them, and I'm like, it's so and so. And he's like, what? You got it? I can't believe it. Blah, blah, blah. So, but now they started beating us, and it's very humbling as an adult for a child to beat you at a kid's game. 
But do you also remember Shoes and Ladders? Do you remember that? It's a game for children three years and older, and the strategy, strategy of the game is simple. Spin the wheel and move your board pieces one to six spaces. The first one to the top wins, but there's a catch. If you land on a ladder, you can instantly be advanced several rows higher. And if you land on a chute, you can suddenly slide down several rows. The manufacturer says that this game develops small motor skills, hand and eye coordination, counting skills, and social development. And all of those things are true. But it can also develop bad theology. There ought to be a label on the outside of the box that says warning. The Surgeon General has determined that playing shoots and ladders can lead to self-centeredness, works, righteousness, and health. Okay, that might be overstating a bit, but just let me tell you what I mean. We live in an age where there's a lot of confusion about God's relationship with us and our relationship with Him. That statement could probably have been made for every generation. I understand that. In Hitler's time, there was a confusion among the people. So many Christians joined his movement. When Jesus walked the hills of Galilee, there was a confusion as to whether one ought to follow the Jew, Jews and the rule of law, or follow Jesus and the rule of love. Always confusion about the relationship God has with us. But today, the confusion has to do with the way we live our lives. There's a sense that the Christian life is about climbing a ladder of religion and that every step up counts. Every act should be righteous and religious. We must look a certain way, talk a certain way, and think a certain way in order to get to the top. And woe to us if we ever land on a shoot. If we do something bad, commit some sin, utter some inappropriate words, or think some so nice thoughts, woe to us. We slide down the chute and we have to start all over again, working our way back up the ladder of religion once more. I'm not saying that the way we live our lives doesn't matter. It matters a lot. Whatever happened to grace? Whatever happened to God's grace? Whatever happened to God's promise to love us and forgive us and to be our savior? no matter what choices we make and what sins we may have committed. The goal of faith is not the same as the goal of shoots and ladders, where we must strive to get to the top. We've already reached the top by the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our purpose is not to earn it or to prove to God that we somehow deserve it, because we don't. Our purpose is to live full lives of thankfulness, to be gracious to others, because God has been gracious to each of us. Our purpose is to cease striving to be righteous and religious and just settle for being real. At the peak of Colorado's Mount Princeton, there's a timber cross inscribed with these words from the 46th Psalm. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Be still. And therein lays the problem. It's not easy being still, especially in our generation. Being still doesn't look very religious. Idle hands are the work, the workshop of the devil. We've heard that saying. When we are still, we're not climbing any ladders. When we are still, we're not striving to reach the top. And so being still is hard work. In the gospel today, Jesus tells us, tells his disciples that it would be this easy. Sorry. In the gospel today, Jesus tells his disciples that it would be this way. Enter through the narrow gate, for the wide gate is easy and leads to destruction. Another scholar translated Jesus' words this way. The one gate is convenient to enter and popular to follow. The narrow gate is more difficult for us. 
And why is that? It is because grace and forgiveness are sometimes hard to grasp. It makes more sense to us to earn our reward, but it made more sense to God to give the reward to those who really don't deserve it, but believe it anyway. That's the narrow gate. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request, Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world, and now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us sing page 507, Through It All, or on the screen. outweigh the needs 
of the few or the one. And yes, I'm showing what a nerd I can be. That's a Star Trek quote, by the way. Spock said that several times. But you get the idea behind it. We are to sacrifice. We are to give. Jesus said in the scripture we read today many things that confused people. And if you're not familiar with Jesus and you read this scripture, you're going to be confused as well. For in verse 24, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now what kind of deal is this? This is confusing. This is not the way of the world. That one kernel is kind of getting a raw deal. You've got to die for others. You have to sacrifice for others. You're getting nothing out of this. You're going to be gone. But for others, fall to the ground and others will benefit. That's confusing when you look at what we teach in this world, the way of this world. But hold that thought for a minute because there's some other confusing stuff in this scripture. Here's another thing that Jesus says. We are to hate our life. Now, not too often in the Bible are we encouraged to hate. So when it says we are to hate, it kind of gets the attention. But if we love or hold on to our life in this world, we will lose it. That sounds like we're going to have to do more sacrificing, more stuff for other people. That sounds like we shouldn't be doing stuff for ourselves, but for others. And we should also not be keeping track of these things of favors. But how, how does this benefit me? How does all this sacrificing benefit me? I'm doing something for somebody else. I'm not getting anything in return. All this sounds confusing when you think about it in the ways of the world. But if you're confused... You're in good company because the people listening to Jesus in the scripture, they were also confused. God speaks. God the Father speaks in verse 28 and says, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Confusion sets in and the people standing there or sitting there listening. What was that? Was that, was that an angel? Did we just hear some thunder? I'm confused. What was that? And then the people get confused again when Jesus says he will be lifted up from the earth. Well, first off, not everyone knew that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't understand he was talking of himself. They understand he was talking about the Son of Man. But was that Jesus? And also, if he's speaking about the Messiah, the Son of Man, at that time that people believed the Messiah was going to live forever, the, excuse me, the Messiah will not be doing this kind of sacrificing. He will glorify us on earth. He will put Israel back on top. Rome will be taken care of. The line of David will live forever. How does this benefit us? How does this benefit me that the Messiah will not live forever? Well, here's the problem. This is why we are confused. We are confused because we are thinking of this world and we are not thinking godly. We are thinking of things that might benefit us for a moment in this world. We are not thinking of things that will benefit us for an eternity.
God is calling us for spiritual benefit. And sometimes when he calls us, we wonder if we should grab the umbrella because we think we just heard some thunder. But God is speaking to us about things that are not of this world. Godly things that are never wasted, never destroyed. Things that last for an eternity. Things that benefit us forever. That single kernel of wheat, that sacrifice, look who benefits. Because of the sacrifice, there is more seed. Because that seed did what God called it to do, there is more seed. The seed grows into food. The farmer benefits. The people benefit. There's more food to eat. There is more money. If it did not do this, it would remain one seed. The person who focuses on this life may believe they benefit short term, but someday that will be gone. And what will happen to all they work to accumulate? How did that benefit long term for an eternity? It did not. The person who gives and sacrifices can make a difference that will last and spread out to many different levels or people. When we look at the scripture we read, the very first part, Greeks are coming, wanting time with Jesus. His ministry got around. When you have success, it spreads. When you listen to God and do godly things, it spreads and people come from far away. They want to be a part because it's something different. It's something good and it lasts. Let's stop and think for a second. If the Messiah actually lived up to what people at that time thought the Messiah would be, and, and I say at that time fully acknowledging that Perhaps today, if we were still waiting for Messiah and he came, we'd have those same type of thoughts. How's he going to benefit us in this world? But if he followed that way, think how it would be different. We talk about this at Christmas. The story of Christmas would be different. What would be the point of coming the way Jesus did? He might as well be born in that house. Surrounded by priests, surrounded by kings and noblemen, not by shepherds. He would be sitting on a throne in Israel today because, remember, he's not going to die. So he'd still be here. Surely the time of Rome would have been a lot short if this was the case. And today, today it'd be different for we would be bowing down to him as a, a king of this world. A king, let me emphasize this, of this world. We would be serving him like we would a king. Maybe out of respect. Maybe out of fear. But probably not out of love and commitment. If this would have happened, the Messiah would have come to this world to rule not to love and serve. Now how would that have benefited us? Our commitment to him is stronger because he did it God's way. And look how we benefited. He was glorified. He was glorified again and again and again and is still glorified today. So the question I ask you, when God speaks to you, do you hear him? Or do you wonder if it's about to rain? Did you think you just heard thunder? When you hear him, do you answer? Or do you hesitate because it takes away 
from what you are wanting, what you are desiring, that short-term fix that we think might make us happy for a moment. How does that benefit me? Now let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about and how a little bit of work, sacrifice, can spread out. Think of all the volunteers we have at the church, all of our leaders, from trustees to finance to worship. Where would this church be if people didn't sit together, pray together, plan together? Where would we be? We probably wouldn't be here. Think of our preschool board. All the children that are coming in here during the day, if they didn't volunteer their time, if they didn't sacrifice the time, where would the kids be? Think of our food pantry and all the years that's been running. How many families have been served? How many families have been fed? And nobody's making one single dollar volunteering your time. We could say, how does that benefit us? It's benefiting them. They're getting some food. But look where it be. That ministry has spread. Think of all the people over these years that we have fed. Now let's think of our new one that we're going to have, along with all these others. Voice of Hope. They have a lot of volunteers. What if they said, how does this benefit me? The ministry wouldn't go very far. Now let me take it a, a step further. There's a handful of people that work for the Voice of Hope, and they get a paycheck. But it's not a very big paycheck. The time they put in, if they spent that time elsewhere, it's a good shot they'd make a lot more money. And I know the ones that are getting paid. They're not wearing designer clothes. Their kids are not wearing designer clothes. Well, they might be. If they are, they're not wearing that many of them. But you see where I'm getting at. Think of all the families that have been touched by this. Having a place in Marion, a place in Besiris, a place in Upper, and now in Forest. Think of all the mothers, all the fathers, all the children that have been educated all the lives that have been touched by this ministry. Thinking of all these things together, if we would stay that one kernel by ourselves, how would we benefit? How would God's name be glorified? But if we look further, we see that in verse 26, Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor, did you hear that word? Honor the one who serves me. That is our benefit. Maybe not this moment, maybe not this time while we're serving food or, or we're starting to see families come in and we're, we're talking to mothers who have a big decision to make. Maybe when we were talking to that mother about, hey, would you like to go to a Christian preschool? Maybe that moment isn't benefiting us. But it's benefiting them. And it's benefiting the kingdom of God. God is pleased. God will honor us. And that is for our benefit. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Give us the strength to hear your call. We don't want to hear thunder. We want to hear you, O oh Lord. We want to know exactly what you want, what you want us to do. We want to follow that, O oh Lord. Because we know your plan is for our benefit. You don't bring us destruction, O oh Lord. You want us to have joy. Not joy of this world. Joy of a different kind. Through you. And that, of course is for everyone's benefit. Building your kingdom will always be for everyone's benefit.